if you're visitors, I'm not the pastor here. Our pastor does most of our preaching. Occasionally, they give others an opportunity, and today is such. Uh, I teach about once a month, once every two months, and I've been going through a series on the church, what really makes a church a church. When you go down the street and you see these nice buildings, is that really a church? Is the Holy Ghost in there? And uh, there's a number of teachings that are online uh, that you can go back to. And also, these are based on, there's a book we have at New Life. It's called Who's in Charge Here? Uh, a Manual for uh, Allowing Jesus to Be the Lord of His Church. And they're available out front if you want to get them. Now, uh, the New Testament series, you can go online, newlifenc.com, media drop down, and you can see uh, either uh, videos or there's actually MP3s and there's also sermon notes. I've been known to go quite fast, so if you want to take notes, just uh, take notes on the high points and don't worry that you get it all. Usually when you hear good preaching, you take one or two things home from you. Now, at, at New Life, we're hoping that our model of leadership, government, worship, intercession is consistent with New Testament teaching. And I think in the past I've said many people want to be a New Testament church. Now, I'm not sure we want to be a New Testament church because some of the New Testament churches like Galatians, Corinthians, were not exactly that good of churches. So what we want to be is a 21st century church in Taylor's North Carolina that's consistent with New Testament and Old Testament teaching. And so much of the teaching from Steve, Allen, and me is based on trying to figure out what should this church look like. Now, some may view our worship here as a bit wild and weird, flags up, lifted hands, guitars, drums, etc. I'm going to make a case today that we're not nearly weird enough and that the model of New Testament worship is the Tabernacle of David. New Testament following churches would, first of all, have a supernatural and not just natural worldview. That is, we believe there's gods, there's demons, there's angels, there's creation by a creator. There's a bunch of stuff going on that you can't see. We accept the Bible as the word of God, respect and honor it, take it literally as much as we can take it literally and spiritually when spiritual interpretation is merited or hinted by the text. We have a historical Christian worldview of morality, which is husband, wife, family, not a pagan worldview of immorality, which includes polygamy, unfaithfulness, homosexuality, and child sacrifice. We appreciate and invite and follow the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit being the only touch on human beings since the incarnation. So it's not a question of do you like the Holy Spirit or not. Uh, no one has seen God, the Bible says, and most of us haven't seen Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the complete, always, all the time touch on the New Testament believer. We promote personal discipleship and transformation so that members can develop the mind of Christ and the fruit of the Spirit. And we encourage member participation, not pastor-priest, exclusive access to God and His work. That's our summary. So we're going to talk a little bit about the New, Te New Testament teaching on worship. Is there a lot of New Testament teaching on, work, on how to worship? There's not a lot, but there's plenty. It, is there a model for how we do this? The Jewish tabernacle, uh, Moses, tabernacle of Moses, temple worship, Jewish synagogue, early churches in history, and current church worship patterns, be it ours or high church. So that's what we have to sort through. There's plenty of Old Testament teaching on worship in the Psalms, which features singing, shouting, dancing, bowing down, lifting hands, playing instruments, stringed instruments, early guitars, blowing trumpets, shofars, banging tambourines and cymbals, drums. And so most of the time as charismatics, we figure, well, we're allowed to do that because it's in the Psalms. But uh, I'm going to make a case that not only are we allowed to do that, but the, the, there's a model in the Old Testament for the way New Testament worship is supposed to be. The question is, was the way it went, they, people worshiped in the Old Testament to continue in the church age, or were we supposed to calm down a bit and get more respectful? Now, some Christian denominations allow singing. Some actually forbid instruments. And those that do allow instruments, historically, it's been mainly the organ or the piano. New Testament verses on worship. Now, worship is more than singing on Sunday morning. Worship in the New Testament is a, a lifestyle. And uh, Jesus, when he's talking to the woman at the well, responds to her complaining that the Jews said that the, the only place you could worship was the temple. Jesus says the time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit 
and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So the secret to New Testament worship may not be tied as much whether there's instruments or not, but whether it's done in the spirit and done in truth. And if, if there's too little truth in a church, or if there's a, an aversion to the Holy Spirit, there may be trouble with worship from the get-go, because it has to be in spirit and in truth. Uh, Paul writes in Romans, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So Paul's making a case that worship is not only just on for 20 minutes on Sunday morning, but the way we live our lives is the way we show worship and appreciation to God. And in Hebrews, the writer says, through Christ then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips that acknowledge his name. And basically, that sacrifice of praise is thank thankfulness. And so we're actually asked through the whole day, be remembering God, lifting his name up, talking to him. So it's like a 24-7 worship is what's asked for in the New Testament. Are there instrument use references in worship in the New Testament? There was music played at the celebration of the turn of the prodigal son. Jesus' response to criticism that he was not as ascetic as John the Baptist's followers was, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. Now trumpets herald the rapture. There's going to be this trumpet when we get taken up. There are instruments used in the book of Revelation. There's harps being played by the 24 elders before God. And trumpets are played by the angels signaling judgment coming on the earth. Now, so if God is really adverse to instruments, um, you know, I wonder why all these other things, you know, they're, they're playing instruments to him around the throne. Um, and you got to always remember that God invented instruments, God invented music, and the devil just tried to steal it all. You know, just because something, you know, the internet's full of a lot of bad stuff, but there's a lot of good stuff on the internet. So the internet wasn't invented by the devil and God sneaking in occasionally. It's everything comes from God and then the devil tries to make a mess of it. So music, worship, instruments come from God and we shouldn't be too worried about using them. In Ephesians 5, the apostle writes, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father, for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the three Greek words here for psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, commentators uh, have been looked at this for a while, but they, they many have the sense that the reason the distinctions are made is the psalms would be psalm-like versus hymns, which would be more a cappella singing. Remember at the Last Supper, the 12 uh, sing a hymn, and they probably don't have a pipe organ there or anything. Um, and then spiritual songs, they think maybe like chanting, but the idea of the psalms, 24 of the psalms call for instruments with it. So it's quite possible that Paul is implying that of the different ways that you worship, instruments would be included. Now in early church history, singing in the church was well documented, instrument use less so, and it's controversial. Some, particularly people that don't use instruments now, would argue that there was no instruments used until 660 AD, and not widely until after the Reformation, but Church fathers Ignatius, Justin Martyr, uh, Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, Hippolytus, and the Christian critic Celsus document instrument use in the church. The, the Celsus was complaining that all the racket these Christians were making in their churches with all the music is his complaint. But so it's very likely that New Testament churches and early church used instruments. Now note, whether instruments or not were used, early church believers sang and worshiped, my point being, they did not just observe the singing of monks, medieval choruses, church choirs, worship teams. They were actually participants. So whether there's instruments or not, we're always called in our life to be worshipers and to be participants in worship. And to make our lives a continuous worship to God by our obedience and dedication to discipleship. There's a built-in need to worship. We are programmed by God, who's the creator, to recognize and admire beauty in art, music, and in people. And so this will either lead us to worship the creator, if we have sense, or the creation. And um, in Romans 1, Paul talks about this big danger. 
And even to this day, we talk about idols being worshipped in the Old Testament by these ignorant uh, ancient people. Well, at least they had the sense to realize there was a demon god behind it. Right now, there's, it's amazing how paganized our society is. And as moderns, we don't realize that there's pagan gods and, and, and demons behind all this stuff. And so the worship of sports stars, media stars, politicians, the cult of personality, all, this, all of this is created. I have as much in common with a blade of grass, an earthworm, and a demon, we have more in common than I have with God. What I mean by that is God's the creator, and all the rest of this is created. So the easy way to be, to be glad that you're a Christian is that we somehow fell into the, by his grace, he turned us on to the possibility we were worshiping the creator and not created things. Everything else is created. The reason we weren't to make graven images is that would be, we would be creating an image of God as a creator. So he, it, it just doesn't work for him. Now, Israel historically and mankind subsequently has tried to get out of worshiping God either by disobedient, unholy, ungrateful lifestyles, or by worshiping other created pagan gods and humans, or by letting professionals do the worshiping for us. This is not probably true. Exodus 20, 18 to 20, what happens, God called the Israelites to the foot of the mountain, and, but they were, it says, when the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of trumpets, and the mountain smoky, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood afar off and said to Moses, you speak to us, not God. We will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. So they said, we don't want to talk to God directly. Moses, you do it for us. So Moses went up on the mountain, beheld God, and I bet he worshiped the first time, but the second time it documents his worshiping. But so he goes up, meets God, worships, and what are the Hebrews up to? Well, they're at the foot of the mountain. They not only did not want to behold God, but they started, they built the golden calf and started worshiping it. You got to worship something. And so if you don't worship God, you end up building things that you'll worship yourself. God responded by giving Israel priests and prophets. They said, look, and Moses couldn't live forever. So he said, you talk for us. You be our intermediary. And God said, fine. I'm going to give you priests, I'm going to give you prophets, and, and the complex instructions on priest consecration, therefore, animal sacrifice, dietary laws, feasts, limited access to the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. So that's what happens. If you don't want to be with God yourself, you'll have to set up a way that there's an intermediary between him and the people. Worship in the Old Testament was defined by more than singing. It involved keeping the law, sacrifice for sins, the festivals, these matters were carefully described by Moses and were led by the Levites. Worship and sacrifice could only occur in Jerusalem at the feast led by the Levites. It was very controlled. Why did God do that? It's because so the Israelites would not worship like the pagan tribes on the high places. So it seems restrictive, but he knew the tendency of worship was so strong that he had said, look, you're going to have to come three times a year to the, temp, to the uh, tabernacle and then the temple, and that's the plan. I know it's inconvenient. It's kind of a bummer, but I can't trust you guys out there by yourself because you're going to worship pagan gods. Now, who was allowed inside the tabernacle and later the temple proper, the holy place and the holy of holies? It's amazing how restricted the access to God was in the Old Covenant. Healthy Levite men only. Number 16, behold, I have given to the Levites all of the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work they do, the service of the tent of meeting. This was back when it was the tabernacle in the wilderness. No longer may the Israelites come near the tent of meeting or they will incur guilt and die. Only Levites. Non-Levite Israelites were not allowed to approach the presence of God in the ark and the holy of holies even lame or blind Levites were banned. Women were only allowed in the court near the temple, and Gentiles were only allowed in the court further out than the women were. The following folk were not even allowed to be in the assemblies, which would be the feast. Eunuchs, illegitimate children to the 10th generation, and descendants of Moabites or Ammonites to the 10th generation, which includes King David, who was a fourth gener generation Moabite. Did we know this? I don't think I knew this. Now, here's a picture of the temple. You'll see, it's kind of hard to see, but you see the temple there? It's up, uh, kind of upper left. The, the Holy of Holies, that little spot in it. Then there's the temple of the priests where the, 
the, um, the lampstand was, the, uh, the altar of incense, and also the showbread. Only Levites could go in there. In front of that was the area that was the sacrifices were done on the bronze altar. And men could come there, but it was mostly Levite work. Then you see the court of the women, women and then the court of the Gentiles. So when you hear all the stories of David worshiping, and if you, all the stories in the chosen, nobody's really in the temple proper. These are people close to the temple in all these courts. Access to the presence, of course, changed with Jesus' death and resurrection. In Hebrews, the writer says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way open for us through the curtain of his body, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. Now, this meant more to the, the Jewish believers than we imagined because they couldn't get near God before. And now with Jesus, every minute, any time we want, we can access him by our spirit. The church has not always been helpful with this correctly understood access to God and worship of him. The Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, and many Protestant churches have a strict hierarchy of priests or pastors, bishops, cardinals, popes, administrators, intermediaries. They place an undue emphasis on the crucifixion. Wait, till, let me clarify that. Mary, the saints, and professionals as intercessors for the laity. They have forbidden laity for having Bibles in the vernacular until the, that was the Catholic Church policy until the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation. They have promoted high church with vestments, incense, choruses, solemnity, crucifix carrying, and pilgrimages. Here's an example of uh, you know, people during the Lent time just go nuts about how upset they are about the crucifixion. Now, did Jesus promote such seriousness in worship and life? Matthew 9, the disciples, at that time John's disciples came to Jesus and asked, why is it that we and the Pharaohs fast so often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus replied, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from, then they will fast. Now, I'll submit to you, theologian that I am, that Jesus is not on the cross still. In fact, he's resurrected, and his spirit is with us in the spirit of the resurrection. And he's the groom with us now. Christianity is not a funeral, it's a preparation for a wedding, in which case we are more in celebration mode. Now, is there a time for appreciating the crucifixion? There is, and it's Holy Communion. And at our church, we take it weekly. Some people take it with every meal, some people daily, the more the better, but we don't do Holy Communion 24-7. We do communion in the remembrance of the crucifixion that the rest of the day we live in the resurrection life the post-crucifixion reality of Jesus by which he gave us the spirit that we could appreciate this. Now, since the resurrection, the model of worship has, not, has been not the tabernacle of Moses or Solomon's table, but the tabernacle of David. Now, in the early days of the charismatic church, there was a lot of teaching on that. I haven't heard much about it, and I ignored it back then. But, of course, uh, the International House of Prayer, uh, Burn 24-7, these are all based on a model of 24-7 worship and the tabernacle of David. So uh, the rest of the talk, I'm going to develop that. In, the, in Amos, the prophet says, in that day, which is actually millennium, but it implies more, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen down and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins and it, I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that are called by my name. So there's a prediction that the tabernacle of David will come about again. And then we see that again in the book of Acts. At the time, Alan is about to get into this in detail in his teaching, but there, um, of course, Paul has his own revelation. He's going to the Gentiles, and even some of the Jews are going to the Gentiles, and the Jews don't know what to do with that in that do the Gentiles have to keep the law? So there's this conference they get together in Acts 15 to decide what's the responsibility of the Jewish believers and of the Gentile believers. And it says, after they stopped speaking, James responded saying, Brother, listen to me. Simon has described how God first concerning, concerns himself about taking a people for his name from among the Gentiles. It was Peter that actually went to Cornelius and released the possibility that the Gentiles could come in even before Paul. And that's what uh, James is reminding everybody of that in this discussion with Paul and Barnabas. 
It says, the words of the prophet agree with this, as it is written, after these days I will return and I will build, rebuild the fallen tabernacle of David so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes all things known. So this is the conference that says, at the conference that it says, we can release the Gentiles to become believers. He brings in the tabernacle of David again. And so that is, it's a, and now truly, uh, not to be, unfair in my exegesis, the whole point here is that the inclusiveness of it. Remember how exclusive the temple was? Nobody gets near this stuff. Well, now the Gentiles are allowed in. That's the main point here. But it's in the setting of the tabernacle of David. So when we look at the tabernacle of David, you'll see how worship is allowed to be of the Gentiles. Now, why did James make the case for the tabernacle? To allow everybody, not just the priests in, and to include the Gentiles. Also, prophetically, he wouldn't have noted, but the temple of Jerusalem had no future. <laughs> Within about 20, 30 years, it was going to be completely destroyed. And then further, a new temple was coming, which was the, new, the temple in the new covenant believers' bodies and the corporate gathering temple of new covenant believers in the same place right here. So there's the temple here of the Spirit, and there's a temple in our hearts which were replacing the old temple. And perhaps in the spirit, the spirit knew, but James was predicting that's the way it was going to be, not a temple-based worship system. 1 Corinthians 3, the apostle says, Do you not know that you yourself are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Then Ephesians, in him the whole building is fitted together and grows into a holy temple, that's the church, in the Lord. In him you two are being built together into a dwelling place, place for God and his spirit. That's the corporate Christian experience. A new God-ordained temple was to be spiritually built in the souls of believers. Its prototype would not be the temple of the law, but the temple of, of Tabernacle of David. And it certainly would not be the rebuilt end times temple that's going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem, which is going to be the Antichrist temple. Temples are on the way out. They're going into in the hearts, and they're about to be completely gone. And the, the tabernacle of David is the model for New Testament church worship and practice, much more so than the tabernacle of Moses, the temple of Solomon, or medieval uh, Roman Catholic liturgical uh, church practice. Now, church practice that emphasizes Old Testament ritual, priests, incense, still on the cross Jesus, high church liturgical tradition endorses, bear with me here, professional priests and pastors versus laity contribution to the work of the faith, Grieving continually over our sins rather than rejoicing in the resurrection, the Spirit's outpouring and our forgiveness and cleansing of sins, a funeral versus a wedding, and a synagogue teaching emphasis model versus a worship emphasis model described in the Tabernacle of David. Do you catch all that? Now truly, I, I go to, every once in a while I go to a Catholic church with family members that are Catholic. I love cathedrals. I like high worship. I like a small dose of high worship. I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but I'm saying the way we do it is quite valid. And the other way looks a little Old Testament -y to me. Anyway, as disciples of Jesus, we are to delight ourselves not only in sports, media stars, singers, pleasures, and entertainment, but also delight in the Lord in gratitude and worship, because worship transforms us. And what we worship, we give power in our lives. And so worship, moment to moment, and in church is more important than we think, not only for God to be you know, like we're trying to help God out or something. This is about us and being transformed into true New Testament worshipers. Now, the Old Testament predicts that the Gentiles would worship God through the ends of the earth. As it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. Again, it says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, extol him, all ye people. Does that sound like super reverent crying worship? It sounds like the plan was we would be joyful worshipers. So I keep making references to the temp tabernacle of da uh, David. In the next a few minutes, let me develop it. I don't believe how I didn't know this, because I think I know the Bible really well. Um, the tabernacle of Moses was the site where the Hebrew congregation gathered at the feast and where the priests performed the sacrifices on behalf of Israel in the wilderness during the time of the judges and the time of kings Saul and David. The Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies in the innermost part of the tabernacle. You've seen this picture. There's a, the, the Jews were camped, on the, all the Jewish people were on the outside of all this 
inside was this court where you could come, and then there was a tent there, and in the tent was the, there was these three items I mentioned before that later were in the tabernacle, I mean later in the temple, and then there was the Holy of Holies. This is what it looked like. The tabernacle and the ark, after its 40-year travel in the wilderness, crossed the Jordan with Joshua and was placed in the town of Shiloh. There's a lot of churches named Shiloh. They named it that because that's where the ark went. Now, a bunch of bad stuff happened in Shiloh too, but that's for another time because uh, most of it's good. Um, now, when the Phil Philistines defeated Israel at the time of Eli and young Samuel, they captured the ark, put it in their temple of their false god in Ashdod. Ashdod is a city just north of the Gaza Strip. It exists to this day. Uh, so uh, then what happened is their god kept, their, their idol kept falling over and his head fell off and his hands kept falling off. And then all the people came down with something called piles, which is another teaching. So it was not good when the ark was there. So the Philippine, Philistines, Philippines, the Philistines freaked out and they sent the ark back. They put it on an ox cart and they just whipped the ox cart and said, you take it back. So it heads back to Israel. Now the Israelis placed the tabernacle and the bronze altar in Gibeon and they placed the ark in kiriath Jerim. So at that time they separated the ark from the tabernacle. Okay, David tried to move the ark to Jerusalem, but the first time he tried, he didn't do it according to the way you're supposed to carry the poles. He had it on a card. Some poor guy touched it and he died and it was a mess and David was mad and God was mad and it was not good. So they again put the ark in this guy's house, a guy named Obed-Edom, and then his house got super blessed in every way. So David tried a second time to bring the ark properly. He did it right this time, he succeeded, but he only brought the ark and a few utensils to Jerusalem. He did not bring the tabernacle poles. He didn't bring the walls or the bronze altars. He left the tabernacle with priests in this other place. So for 40 years, the ark was completely separated from the tabernacle and from the sacrifices. Then David built a tent, a new tabernacle, over the ark and commanded worship in or near it 24-7. And you don't figure out how many. Initially, it was probably a few hundred. By the time of Solomon, it was thousands of worshipers. There was tons of worship 24-7. In Chronicles, it shows this. So David left Asaph. He's a writer of a lot of the Psalms and his brothers before the Ark of the Covenant to minister in Jerusalem regularly according to the daily requirements. David left Zadok, the priest, and his fellow priest before the tabernacle of the Lord at the high place in Gibeon to regularly present burnt offerings on the Lord morning and evening according to all that was written in the, Lord, the law of God. Now, there is no place in Moses' teaching that this was supposed to happen. David is amazing what he gets away with. You know, he's an adulterer. He's a guy, I mean, he's a pretty tough guy. For, to get his first wife, he had to bring the father of the first wife 200 foreskins from Philistines. You know, it's like, he's not, he's a warrior. He's an adulterer. He's kind of, he eats the, he goes into the showbread, eats the bread of the showbread, and then all the priests get killed. How is it? So, so one day, David gets this idea, hey, I got an idea. I'm going to bring the ark only here, and I'm going to leave the rest over there. And there's, you're not supposed to do that. How is he forgiven? Well, it's because he's such a worshiper that God cuts him some slack. And the Bible says, New Testament says, love covers a multitude of sins. Well, worship also puts you in a different place with the heart of God. And although he, he, I'm not endorsing evil here, it's like if you were a worshiper, he'll, he'll cut you more slack. And that's what he did with David because there's nowhere in the Bible that you're supposed to have done this thing. Now, at the tabernacle of David, King David, who was not a Levite and who was a descendant of a Moabite, had full free access to the presence of God of the ark. Do you see what he was up to? He, now, also, when you read the Psalms, don't you think that David is worshiping in the temple? The temple isn't built yet. Okay, it's, David is not worshiping in the temple, and he wasn't allowed near the tabernacle. He is worshiping in or near the tabern his tabernacle. So all the Psalms, most of them are about the tabernacle of David worship. Now, further, there was no recorded division uh, between the holy place and the holy of holies, no veil. Everyone could access the presence. Now, nobody knows for sure if this was a little tent. No, everybody's kind of nervous about the notion that all of Israel was jumping around, banging into the ark. You know, maybe there was a little protection around it, but you got to get darn close. Oh, look at that. Nice. I think that is, 
I think that's a symbol for something, you know, but I don't know. I'll need the prophets to, to, to help me with that anyway. Now, so not only could David go the, to, the, to worship at the tabernacle of David, the common Israelites, the bastards, the eunuchs, the lame, the descendants of pagans, David himself, Gentile proselytes were all allowed equal access around this place. Okay, David says, one thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to choir in his temple. He's talking about the tabernacle. Further, in, in Psalm 23, where he goes, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David is thinking eternally. You know, he's got it. It's like, I have figured out that I can access and love God, not only with my little tent here <laughs> that I did this that you're not supposed to do, but forever, for eternity, I can do it. In Psalm 15, O Lord, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell on your holy mountain, he who walks with integrity and practices righteousness, who speaks the truth. So really the access now was not whether you're Jew or Gentile, not whether you have both your arms or not, it was your, your holiness, just as it is right now. Now the separation of the ark from the tabernacle also resulted in a different type of worship than that which occurred typically in Moses' tabernacle. At David's tabernacle, the people made sacrifices of praise instead of animal sacrifices. Now this may be a little embarrassing, but, but you know, uh, Robert you know, is the fellow who comes up here and dances with the flags, Robert, a friend of ours. Now, you, those who don't know probably think he's this wild, crazy, charismatic guy. Now what you don't know is I don't think I know a more responsible, not crazy, husband, father, grandfather, churchman, civic leader, business leader than Robert. Robert. Would you guys agree? I mean, <laughs> I mean, and what it is, God told him one time, you need to worship. And he said, okay. And that is a sacrifice of praise. Now, in the, if, we, if we were in the Old Testament, at our church, you would have to have gone to the Burks farm and got a goat or got a chicken, and then in our lobby we would set up a way that you would sacrifice, and that'd be a, that'd be a, a lot of hassle for us, wouldn't it? You know, I mean, in terms of if you wanted to do a sacrifice, but that'd be that'd be a pain. Now all he's asking us is uh, this sacrifice of willing to not only in our life but occasionally let him know that we like him and love him, and we're going to worship him. And that's the sacrifice of praise in the tabernacle of David. They clapped their hands, they lifted their hands, they shouted, they danced, they played instruments. Now the size of David's tabernacle is nowhere stated. Uh, there's hundreds of priests and singers ministering there. Some commentators believe it was modeled after Moses' in size, we don't know. But it existed for a brief period of time between the tabernacle of Moses and the temple that David's son Solomon constructed about 40 years later. But, but it wasn't just that long because if you look at the Old Testament, the kings of Judah, which were the good kings, like Hezekiah, Josiah, Zerubbabel, they always say that the worship, this is a quote, is according to the commands of David. So they kept the style of the David tabernacle even when the temple was established under the good kings. So the bad kings, the temple had, was used for cult prostitution and all kinds of stuff. When he had good kings, there was good worship. Prophecies predicted the future restoration of David's tabernacle, not the tabernacle of Moses, nor the temple, beyond the final Herod's temple. The prophet Isaiah wrote that the Messiah would rule from the tent of David. When the oppressor, the Antichrist, is gone, destruction has ceased, and the oppressors have vanished from the land, in loving devotion, a throne will be established in the tent of David, a judge Christ, will seeking justice and hastening righteousness will sit on. So in the millennial reign, this tabernacle will continue as the throne. So he, instead of like on a political throne, Christ is going to set himself up in the worship place, throne, tabernacle of David, which David wasn't supposed to build, but he has approving of this idea of all access to him and worship being that important to him. It's quite cool. Christ will rule the millennium from the tabernacle of David, from the lineage of David on a literal throne, the church gets to experience the tabernacle of David spiritually now and in a taste of millennial rule if we are willing to embrace this teaching, which is that we are allowed to worship God like David. Now, after the tribulation millennium, all temples and tabernacles, divine and pagan, will cease. Uh, the purposes of tabernacles, God, God's tabernacle and all the pagans, was to figure out a way that we humans could meet the gods. 
Now, in the ziggurats, what they would do is they would sacrifice their children or, or prisoners or put their, send their wives up there for the gods to have sex with them. Honestly, that's what they did to keep the gods happy. There was this intermediary. Now, with us, of course, it was the tabernacle or the Holy of Holies. But once God dwells with us, there's no need for temples anymore. It says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. I heard a loud voice from the throne. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with him. But I saw no temple in the city, because the Lord God and the Lamb are its temple. So what we're headed for is temple-less reality <laughs> as we get closer and closer to the true presence of God. Now, the tabernacle of Moses had old covenant purpose and significance. It showed that holiness was needed to appear before the presence of the holy God. No sin, no illegitimacy, no disabilities, no imperfection, no Gentiles were permitted. It had its place. It wasn't all bad. That was for its time. But the tabernacle of David has the new covenant purpose of making a way who all who trust in God have equal access to God's presence. I will write my laws on their hearts. Quickly, I just in the red, if you can read it, the assignments in, in the tabernacle included bronze cymbals, playing harps, leading the music, blowing trumpets. So the guys were, they were going to make a bunch of racket in the tabernacle of David. The Pentateuch, the first five books, is dedicated to how the tabernacle of Moses and the temple of Solomon was to function, but the book of Psalms is dedicated to the tabernacle of David. The Psalms are like the hymnals in the pews of the tabernacle of David. And it's fun to enjoy them. Uh, I won't read all the verses, but quickly. The instructions in, for praise in the tabernacle include singing, clapping your hands, dancing, lifting your hands in worship, which shows respect to the Lord, shouting, raising up banners. It's all there that this is okay. And finally, use musical instruments. Psalm 151, praise him with the trumpet, praise him with harp and lyre, praise him with the timbrel and dancing, sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, the sound of melody, trumpets, etc., etc. So, I don't know, for most of you, this was not necessary, but for me, as a serious Bible scholar, I wanted to show you not only are we allowed to use the Psalms, probably the Psalms are the way we're supposed to be worshiping in the tabernacle of David. Now, uh, Karen, uh, you could come up with the worship team, please. Or just Karen? <laughs> <laughs> okay, with the church being the prophetic taste and spiritual fulfillment of the, of the restoration tabernacle of David, normal New Testament approved expression of worship should be inclusive, particularly of Gentiles of every tribe, tongue, race, and nation. No distinctions in any direction, no segregation. It's all the same. But also women, the disabled, and the poor. It should be participatory, constantly open for everyone to delight in and worship the Lord exuberant and loud with dance and instruments. This is the way it looked. There was two great commandments in the Bible. Love the Lord God with all your heart, your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And I will suggest there's two commissions. The great commission we know, which is to testify what Jesus did for you, us. And the second, I will, this is the Craig's second commission. Anyway, like Dave, I'm doing like David. I'm putting a new thing in the Bible here is to become a worshiper and offer a sacrifice of praise. Now, the reason this is important, those four things you can do the day after you're saved. You don't need 20 years of theology training at a seminary. You, we can tell other people about Jesus, and we can worship from day one of the faith. And so I'm inviting all of us to more embrace the early days when we knew the joy of our salvation and we didn't have to think to do us or a teacher didn't have to tell us, it was automatic. We were telling everybody about Jesus and we were thanking Jesus and jumping up and down. And this is what we're allowed to do. No training, no gift development needed. And so and here, here's a picture from the chosen. You know, you see, that's probably the, this is now, Herod, as bad as he was, built an awesome temple, way better than the second temple. And so here's part of the pillars in front of the area surrounding the temple. And this is the portico there. And Jesus is teaching while the Pharisees are looking on unhappily because he's about to release all of us into access to Jesus, the presence, and the ability to worship as we like. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word. I pray that all of us daily have the opportunity and take the opportunity to, without constraint, to worship you, be grateful for what you've done in our lives. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.